right. Well, let's pray and we can get started. If you guys don't already have a syllabus, you guys already grabbed them. Never mind. You might put those on the back, on the table behind you there, John, Josh. Let's pray and we can get started and as guys file in, they'll get started along with us. So, uh, Father, thanks so much for the opportunity that we have today to look into your word. ask that you would bless our time, bless the energy and effort that these guys put forth today as they look to learn, uh, as they look to learn your word. Uh, just ask that, uh, Father, you would bless our time through this class and that these guys would learn uh, and be obedient to what you have revealed of yourself in the prophets and, uh, Father, in the writings in the Old Testament. Lord, we look forward to what, ha- what you have for us here, and uh, Lord, we pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. All right, well, welcome to Old Testament 2, where we cover the latter prophets and the writings. Uh, I don't have a new aims and goals uh, sheet for you because it's essentially the same thing. You can just take the aims and requirements page out of, uh, out of the previous class and you can stick in uh, the latter prophets and writings and in the appropriate places and I want you to have the same things uh, down. I want you to understand the same things. Uh, we are looking for uh, a broad overview of what's going on in the latter prophets, so what we generally think of as the prophets in the Old Testament, and then also we're going to finish out the writings. So we'll cover a lot of what we generally think of as writings, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, etc., uh, as we finish out as we finish out the Old Testament in this first six weeks, and then we'll jump for the next six weeks into the New Testament. Um, I'm still working on your your supplementary material for the class. If we can find it cheap enough, the the book that I want you guys to have is uh, Andrew Hill and John Walton's Survey of the Old Testament. Uh, It's my favorite Old Testament survey book because it gives you a lot of the information that we're talking about, uh, but it does so with lots of really nice pictures. So that's... uh, so that's what I'm hoping that we can find uh, in an affordable way uh, here this week. Uh, if we can't for some reason, then I'll make it up for you. I'll make it up to you by providing you with two books instead of one. Uh, John Walton's Old Testament uh, charts and background, background and chronological charts and Paul Benware's survey of the Old Testament. So I'll have these for you next week. Uh, did we do Benware already? Is that what we did? No. We did the kingdom of priests, didn't we? Yeah, but I talked about Benware. So hopefully we can figure out how to do Hill and Walton for an, for an appropriate price. But if not, we'll, uh, we'll do John Walton. So the lots of pictures are, it's really nice. Uh, they're really cool pictures as well. So uh, that's my goal. This, this afternoon, we will take an overview uh, of the latter prophets and then we'll start into Isaiah. It'll be very much the same format as we had before. Uh, yeah, pretty much actually exactly the same format as we had before. So uh, we'll start going from there. Any questions before we get started? Uh, I would like for you guys as we go to continue to skim over a book or two a week. And just to just to take some time. And, uh, and like we talked about with... Uh, like we talked about with the other Old Testament books, uh, take some time and read the first couple of verses and the last couple of verses in, of each chapter uh, and just get an idea of what the full overview of the book looks like uh, so that you can, um, A, practice that skill, and it is a skill, and it's a valuable skill as you study your own Bible to be able to scan and understand how a book is working, how the, how the flow of thought unfolds, how the plot unfolds, and then also to, be, to, to have a good understanding of the books themselves. Um, have a broad understanding of the books themselves. Uh, so, you guys online, 
Um, I've got a new computer, so I don't have it set up yet to show the uh, to show the PowerPoint over the um, right on the Google Chat. But you should be able to see it at least reasonably well up here on the on the wall. And then we will all all have it set up next week. I should have it set up next week to go back to that format, so you'll be able to follow along probably more easily uh, with it up there. But if you'll bear with me for this week, uh, we'll we'll make it up here next week. So as we jump in, uh, remember that the Hebrew Old Testament is broken up into how many groups of books? Yeah, very good. Okay, well, three, right? The law, which is the Pentateuch as we have it, the prophets, the prophets break down into two groups and then the writings, yep. Uh, very good. So as we looked at the law last time, uh, we saw the beginnings of the nation Israel and the intent that God had, the instruction that God had given them in the Mosaic law for them to function as his people, for him to walk among them as his God. Now the prophets breaks down into two groups and we talked about one of those groups last time. What are the two groups of the prophets? Do you remember? The old, what's that? Uh, major and minor is how we generally look at them in, the, in our English Bible. But in the Hebrew Bible, they broke them down between the former prophets and the latter prophets. Remember the former prophets were uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. And which direction do the former prophets look? Do they look forward or backward? They look backward, right? The former prophets give us an overview of the, the history of the nation Israel. And you'll remember that they talked about the fact that Israel had failed to do what? They'd failed to obey the Mosaic Covenant. Now, this semester, this, this class, we're going to look at the latter prophets. And these are the guys that we usually think of as the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, uh, all of those minor prophets as well. And their view is generally the opposite from the former prophets. The latter prophets look to... The latter days. If that helps you remember the difference between the former and the latter prophets, the former prophets look to the former days. The latter prophets look to the latter days. And what was the job of the prophet? But to come on the scene and say, look, wake up. You're not following the law, so you should pay attention. Because if you don't follow the law, God's going to bring judgment. And if you do, he's going to bring blessing. And invariably, the prophets are coming and they're saying, God's bringing judgment. The people fail to repent. And they say, God's going to bring judgment. He's going to take you out of the land. But someday, ultimately, who's going to come? Messiah is going to come and he is going to restore the nation Israel. Uh, so they look to the end times uh, in all of that. We're also going to take a look then at the writings that didn't deal with historical narrative. So Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, Lamentations. Do we do Lamentations already? We didn't, did we? Lamentations we'll talk about. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up those as well and talk about where their place was uh, in the Old Testament canon and how they uh, worked for the, uh, how they worked in the, uh, uh, in the worship uh, of the nation and get an overview of what's going on in those books. So first of all, let's take a look at the latter prophets. Uh, and we are on page six of your syllabi if you want to follow along here. Important for us to know what books are included in the latter prophets. First of all, we have Isaiah. And he 
is the major ladder prophet. Uh, he is the ladder prophet par excellence. He's the one that the people thought of when they thought of the prophets, um, the major writing ladder prophet. And he is called to write down his oracles. So we have these men who come on the scene. Do you remember we talked about when we looked through Deuteronomy, who sets the stage for the prophets? Who, who sets precedent for them? Mm, no? Who, who gives the model for what the prophets are going to be like? Huh? Remember Moses. Moses, Moses sets the model for what they're going to be like. Moses comes, he ministers, he represents whom to whom? Who does he speak for? He speaks for God to whom? To the people, right? So consistently, he speaks for God to the people. You can, am I echoing back there? Uh, oh, you know what? I'll bet it's through his headphones, There you go. Okay. <laughs> Moses comes and he speaks uh, on behalf of God to the people. He ministers to them. He tells them how God expects them to, to, to act. And then at the end of the life, God, at the end of his life, God directs him to go and write down his oracles. So this is what happens with uh, as a general rule, it seems that these men, these major prophets, the latter prophets, uh, went through their life of ministry and then they wrote down uh, the words of their oracles later in life. Uh, you can see Isaiah 37, 2, if you're interested in that. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household of Shebna, uh, the scribe and the elders and the priests, uh, covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. Ooh. I guess this is a picture of his ministry. I have maybe this written down wrong. But you see that Isaiah serves as a, as a prophet, and you see something of Isaiah's role there. He is a, he is a prophet to the kings. Uh, he ministers to royalty very, very often. Jeremiah uh, is the next of the latter prophets. Ezekiel is called to his ministry in Ezekiel chapter 2. Then you have the 12. Uh, these are what we would think of today as the minor prophets. Uh, and in the Old Testament canon... Uh, in the Hebrew Old Testament, the minor prophets functioned as a single book. All right, they functioned um, they functioned simply as, or they were referred to simply as the twelve. Uh, that's why sometimes in the in the New Testament you'll see uh, one of the minor prophets referred to as writing something that's in one of the other minor prophets, and really they're just they're seeing the whole book work together uh, as one. And we'll talk about how the minor prophets function together as a unit uh, when we consider that part of the that part of their sur of our survey. But the twelve minister throughout the uh, all of these uh, minister throughout either the monarchy period or into the uh, into the period of the exile. And we'll talk about where they fall as we as we talk about each of these groups. Their place in the canon, what did the prophets do? Uh, they function in relation to the Torah, in relation to the law. And one of the things that we're going to see is that an understanding of the Torah is essential to understanding the prophets. Because the ministry of the prophets was to alert the people when, when they weren't following the Torah. We've said this a couple of times. Uh, the ministry of the prophets generally looked like this. The people disobey. God sends the prophet to the people to tell them, you're disobeying. You're not following the law. Uh, you need to follow the law or you're going to be punished. 
You're going to be disciplined. Uh, and if you obey, then I will bless you. But their ministry, by and large, was to alert the people, was to alert the people that, uh, uh, that they were not following what God had instructed them. In relation to the other prophets, in relation to the former prophets, remember we already touched on this as well, the history of, the, of Israel is told through the eyes of the prophets and the former prophets. Uh, the prophets here, these prophets fill in Moses. So Moses said, this is how you're to act. And they go back and say, remember what Moses said and you're not acting this way. So you're not acting as Moses told you you needed to act and so these prophets come on a regular basis. The latter prophets then look forward to the exile. This is the key event in the, in the prophets, in the latter prophets. They are looking toward when God will bring judgment on the nation. In fact, we, uh, we even organize the prophets by whether they're pre-exilic, exilic, or post-exilic prophets. So, this is the major event as it pertains to the prophets, the major Old Testament event. Obviously, we know that ultimately the prophets look forward to the coming of Christ, uh, both the first and the second coming. Uh, and so we know that they also look beyond the exile, ultimately to renewal and restoration. It's going to be a common theme in the prophets. There's going to be a fairly regular basis where we say, that, the, that the prophet, this prophet's book breaks up like this. The first half, the prophet says judgment is coming. And the second half, the prophet says salvation is coming beyond the judgment. That's going to be a consistent theme as we consider how the latter prophets write and what goes, uh, what goes along with them. Any questions about how these, how these sections of the Old Testament work together? All right. Now a few words about the prophets themselves. First of all, it's significant to see and take note of what the prophets were called. So their designations... The first thing that we see that they're called in the Old Testament, they're often called prophets. These are men who are called to speak for God. So the first thing that a prophet does is he speaks God's word. Okay, the first thing that the prophet does, the first thing that he does is he speaks God's word. This starts with Aaron who speaks for Moses. Ultimately, the Messiah would be a prophet. In Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, he would speak God's word to the people. But when, when the prophets are called prophets, that's the major focus, is the fact that they are called to be God's mouthpieces. Prophets are also in the Old Testament on a fairly regular basis called the man, a man of God or men of God. They are men who belong to God, they are bound to God's will, and they are to do it. Moses is called a man, the man of God, Deuteronomy 33.1, Samuel, Elisha. These, these prophets are called you man of God, and they are bound to do God's will. They're men who are bound and called to do what God has called them to. We also see that they are called seers. Another characteristic of prophets is they receive God's revelation. They see God's word. So the prophet is called a prophet. He speaks for God. He is a man of God who belongs to God. He is a seer who receives God's revelation. He sees what the Lord has for the people. And he tells the people then what God has in store for them. So they were men who spoke for God, who, who were God's mouthpieces. They spoke God's word. They were men of God. They belonged to God. They were bound to God's word. They were 
to be obedient. They were seers. They received God's revelation. They saw God's word. And their position in society, their position in the nation, first of all, fundamentally, they received a message from the Lord for the people. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. As we consider who the prophets were and why they came and what their job was, Deuteronomy 18, you can write down as a key passage. And pick up in verse 14. It says, For those nations which you shall dispossess, gee, verse, those nations which you shall dispossess, it's kind of like saying Willie's real, real rear wheel. That was a fun tongue twister I learned over the break. For these nations which you shall dispossess, listen to those who practice witchcraft and diviners. But as for you, Yahweh your God has not allowed you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. From among you, from among your countrymen, you shall listen to him. So we see here that uh, Moses is kind of the archetype of the prophets. uh, But also that the prophets look forward to the ultimate prophet who will be the Messiah. Is one of the reasons that when... Jesus comes on the scene and he asks his disciples, who do, who do the people say that I am? And one of the answers the people give is, they say that you're the prophet. And that would have been an accurate uh, description. Ultimately, this looks forward to Christ. But Christ is the ultimate picture of what the prophets were to be. And he goes on and says, this is what the prophets will look like in their ministry. This is according to all that God has asked of the Lord your God, or all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again from the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see his great fire anymore or I will die. The Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them, and I will all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So this is the job of the prophets. He is to receive a message from the Lord for the people and then go and proclaim that message on his behalf. We also see that they're in an interesting position because only absolute accuracy was acceptable for the prophets. That if you were a prophet, you had to be right all of the time. It was never okay for you to say, God says this, and God says this is going to happen, and then for any less than all of what you said was going to happen, for that to happen. We read on in verse 20, but the prophet who shall speak a word presumptuously in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he shall speak in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Now you may say in your heart, how shall we know that the word which, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks it in the name of the Lord, if the things has not come out, or come about, or which, or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and you shall not be afraid of him. So if the prophet ever came to the people with a message of his own, if he ever came and said, you know, I think this would be good for the nation Israel to do, so I'm going to tell him that God has sent me to tell him to do it. And then he says, this is how you know what I say is true. And whatever it is that he says doesn't happen, God says, kill him. So they were to speak for God, but only when God sent them to speak. 
Only when God sent them to speak. So they were to speak on behalf of the Lord to the people, uh, all and only what the Lord told them to speak. What was foretold about the immediate future was proof. Oftentimes in the prophets, you'll see the prophets say, this is going to happen as a sign for you. This is how that you're going to know that what I say is true is going to happen. Or this is, this is going to happen in the future and that's how you know what I'm saying now is true. The other thing that this does, when, when someone says this is going to happen in the near future, but he also says that there's something that's going to happen in the distant future, if what he says ha- is going to happen in the near future happens, what does that tell you about what he said is going to happen in the distant future? Did you get all those near and distances? Yeah, near and distance. Well, it's guarantee, it's proof that what he says in the long term is also going to play out. Is it easier to tell with 100% accuracy the near future or the far future? Well, neither, right? You can't tell with 100% accuracy what's absolutely going to happen. Both are equally impossible. And so, if what he says is going to happen at some time in the near future happens, then what he said is going to happen in the distant future is also going to happen. And you can take it to the bank. Now the character of these men, they were by and large, first and foremost, men of the word of God. Men of the word of, men of the, word of the Lord. Take a look at Isaiah chapter 6. And you see what is to characterize them. This is Isaiah's call to ministry. Actually, come over to Jeremiah chapter 1. This is going to... The Lord said to me, do not say that I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. God tells the prophets, you go and tell the people what I tell you to tell them, and you do it without fear, and you do it without hesitation, because I am with you, and you are speaking my word. Don't shirk your responsibility by not telling them everything I tell you to tell them. You go and be obedient. They are also men of authority. There is authority that is given to them. Turn back just a couple pages to Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to be empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Now we're talking here about God's word, but who's the one speaking God's word here? Who's the one speaking for God? Isaiah is, right? So if the prophet spoke, you were to obey. They spoke with God's authority because they spoke God's word. All right, quickly, I'd like to lay the theological background for the prophets as well. The ministry of the prophets, uh, in many ways, mirror uh, the ministry of Moses. And remember what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 18, that the prophets will come who are like whom? We're like Moses, right? 
Ultimately, the prophet will supersede Moses, but Moses sets the tone for the way that the prophets will minister and how they'll function. They come, first of all, with a message that is explanation and exhortation. They tell what's going to happen and why it will happen, and they give stipulations for the people. And this looks like this. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings curses. You're going to get sick of hearing that. But that's what Moses told the people about the law. That's what the prophets tell the people about the law. If you obey, God will bring blessing. If you disobey, he will bring cursing. And he also gave expl- they also gave explanation of future, the future course of events, just like Moses did. Now, we don't generally think of Moses as doing that but he does on a fairly regular basis. He says, when you go into the land, this and this and this and this and this are going to happen. Idolatry, exile, restoration. That's That's the consistent pattern that we're going to see again in the prophets is that the people are idolatrous, they are headed for the exile, but ultimately they can look forward to Restoration, And that was what Moses told the people as well. And then through their writings, the prophets, just like Moses did, left witness to future generations. The characteristics of Moses' prophetic ministry look an awful lot like an awful lot of the prophets. Moses was chosen and prepared by God. You remember the story about Moses' childhood? He is saved from death at the hands of the Egyptians uh, because he is God's chosen instrument. He is prepared by God in a number of different ways. He is eventually called by God. Where is Moses called by God to his ministry? Yeah, Mount Sinai and the burning bush, right? We see that as a, we see this as a consistent uh, event with the prophets as well. Who are some of the prophets that you can think of who are called? Isaiah, right? That's in Isaiah 6. Who else do we see? Ezekiel. Yep, that's, uh, that's at the beginning of the book of Ezekiel as well. Uh, who else? We already looked at Jeremiah. Who's the one that's called and doesn't go? Jonah. Well, we think of Jonah as well. All of these guys, though, they're sent by the Lord. Some of them we get a, a greater insight into what that call looked like than others, but these men are called by God. Consistently, what does Moses do? He tells the people, he and Aaron, tell the people what God has told them to tell to the people. And so what do the, what do the prophets do? They follow in the footsteps of that ministry. They receive God's word from him. They receive the word of God. And then they go and they speak God's message. They tell the people what God has sent them to tell them. And then... They write down God's message. And it seems that for most of these guys, uh, their books, the books about their prophecies are compiled toward the end of their lives. Uh, And that would be consistent with uh, the way that Moses functioned. It seems that he wrote the law right at the end of his life. Wrote the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy uh, right around the end of his life. or at Mount Sinai. Uh, The historical background then of the latter prophets, you can take a look. You should have that chart. Did I print the charts for you guys? Shucks. 
Oh, is there, it's, is it in your syllabus there? Okay. Yeah, there you go. You've got dates there. Let me look. Oh, you know what? When I printed this out, I was thinking that the charts were in the syllabus because that happens. Those charts, he puts, the charts are in the syllabus for, for the New Testament survey. I'm sorry, guys. That was, that was my fault. I will print out the charts for you uh, for next week and make sure that you get those. Um, but you do see the historical background of the latter prophets. Um, Gives you an idea of when these guys were ministering. You see Isaiah, Hosea, Amos uh, ministering during Uzziah's reign. You can get an idea of, of when these guys were, were ministering there. We'll make note of this as we go. Uh, so not too big of a deal to get the exact details down right now. But any questions about then the... Uh, the major elements of the uh, of the latter prophets. All right, that gives you a pretty good overview of what's going on with these fellas. Yeah. Um. Some of them ministered to kings, but none of them would have like, like Samuel did, it doesn't seem. Uh, in the southern kingdom, um, in the southern kingdom, this, the line of succession is pretty well set. Uh, you've, got David's, you've got David's line on the throne there, and that's a stable, that's a stable situation there in Judah. Uh, in the northern kingdom, uh, you have uh, you have less stability, but usually the stability uh, is overthrown by by violence and intrigue. Um, so no, no, no is the short answer to your question. Um, certainly, none of them. Well, I should say it doesn't seem that any of them functioned like Samuel did, where Samuel anoints the next king um, at God's behest. So, that's a, that's a good question. Now we come to the book of Isaiah. Maybe. There we go. The book of Isaiah. The title of the book is named after the prophet. Isaiah's name means uh, Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh will save. And that is apt because that's the heart of Isaiah's message. That salvation comes by the Lord. That he brings salvation. The focus of the book is primarily on Judah and Jerusalem. Judah comes up as mentioned 26 times. Jerusalem is mentioned in the book 46 times. Zion is mentioned, which is the mountain that, uh, that it, Jerusalem sits on, mentioned 47 times. The city, 18 times. Another word for city, uh, another six times. So it's very clear that the movement there is from old Jerusalem to the new Jerusalem. Uh, but Judah, Jerusalem, certainly the focus of Isaiah's attention. Certainly the focus of Isaiah's attention. Isaiah's ministry uh, happened between 739 B.C. and 681 B.C. So I'm going to ask you to remember some of the things we talked about last class. 
Now, this is as scary for me as it is for you because I get to see if you guys remember what we talked about. Uh, what's going on in this time period? What's the major event that happens in, during Isaiah's ministry? Yeah, the Assyrians capture, destroy the northern kingdom. Okay, so how does that put us on the timeline here? Are we fairly early? Are we fairly late? Are we right in the middle somewhere? Yeah, we're, we're pretty late as far as the kingdoms are concerned. Uh, David, remember, when does David rule? Uh, roughly. Yeah, it's, it's right around 1000 BC. That's, uh, it, if you can break up the, the history of Israel this way, it's helpful. Abraham is right around 2000, David is right around 1000, and Christ is right around zero. So, so if you can remember to break it up into, into thousand year blocks, uh, that's about how it plays out. Uh, Abraham, 2000. Uh, David 1000, and that moves us into the kingdom era. So when does the southern kingdom fall? Five something is right. 586 is when Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem. Okay, so that gives you an idea. Between 1000 and then 580, 586, we're... We're well over halfway. We're halfway through the, mon the period of the monarchy. Okay, we're, we're well into this. And the fall of the northern ten tribes happens during Isaiah's ministry. During Isaiah's ministry. Uh, he is, though, the first of the latter prophets chronologically. He is right there amongst, among the first. So who are the major prophets that had come on the scene before Isaiah? Who are some of the guys that you can remember before Isaiah? Nathan, he ministered to. David, all right. Samuel, uh, yeah, he has something of a prophetic ministry. He's the last of the judges. Elijah and Elisha, okay. I have to remember where Micaiah is. But yeah. <laughs> yep, yeah, very good. Moses. Moses. So some of these guys, I just want to set a, a bit of a time frame for you. What this tells you though, and part of what I want to point out is the writing prophets, the, the major prophets as we think of them, don't come until later on during the kingdom period. Okay, they don't come until later on in the monarchy period. So Isaiah is the first of the latter prophets, chronologically speaking. He also is the first of the latter prophets uh, thematically. He really sets the tone for the rest of the latter prophets. And we could consider this we could consider this the, uh, the most important or the second most important uh, section of Scripture outside of the Torah, uh, Old Testament Scripture. All right, let's consider some of these kings. And what was the time of uh, Isaiah like? And I realize some of this is a little small. We've got a lot of information on this one. Come to, uh, come to Isaiah chapter 1. In verse 1, you see that Isaiah's prophetic career happened during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And he's going to live on into the uh, time of Manasseh. Uh, tradition has that Manasseh uh, had Isaiah killed. But Uzziah, was he a good king? Bad king? I guess I already gave it away. U Uzziah's a good king. 
And he is the second of three consecutive good kings. Okay, he's the second of three consecutive good kings. This would be the king that Isaiah grew up under. He, so he grew up in a, in a pretty good environment as far as, as far as godliness is concerned or the godliness of the leadership at least. The only thing that uh, Kings and Chronicles has against Uzziah is that he left the high places. Uh, so he did not uh, deal with some of the idolatry that was going on uh, and some of the poor practices of worship uh, within the nation. But he did, he did a generally a good job. Next we have Jotham. He reigned from 750 to 731 BC. He's also another good king. The problem with Jotham is that he also left the high places. Now we take a turn for the worse. Okay, we come to Ahaz. Some of these kings overlap each other because there are vice regencies. Uh, sometimes as the king got old and maybe incapacitated a new king, uh, the, the successor would come into power. Uh, Ahaz, though, is an evil king who not only leaves the high places, but he also uses the high places himself that Uzziah and Jotham failed to get rid of. Ahaz is also foolish as he joins an alliance with Assyria. He replaces the brazen altar at the temple. He desecrates the temple Ahaz is not a good dude. All right? He also didn't learn one of the cardinal rules of history when he allied with Assyria. If you are a little nation, don't call in the big boys. Okay? Because what do big boys do when you call them in? Yeah, they stay. Have you ever read the, uh, the books, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie?, He's going he's gonna to ask for a, for a cup of milk. And yeah, if you give a moose a muffin, the same, the same kind of thing. That's the way these big nations were. That's the way these big empires were. They oftentimes horned their way in to new places because somebody called somebody else because they felt threatened by somebody else. And then the big nation gets there and says, okay, well, we're going to just stay now. Thank you very much. Uh, but Ahaz is a, an evil king, yes. The high places were places of sacrifice and worship, uh, usually idolatrous worship, but uh, even if they were trying to worship Yahweh in those high places, they were not doing it where God said he wanted them to worship. Um, so they were places of evil worship either because they were idolatrous or because they were uh, misdirected. Yeah, that's why they, they, found, they find a high place. And a lot of times you worshiped a God based on where you were uh, in, that, in the polytheistic uh, thinking. Uh, you had a God who was the God of the mountains and a God who was the God of the valleys and all that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, they're called the high places because they're in, in the hills. A lot of times the idols are made out of wood or trees or stone. Yep. 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 Mm. Boy, you catch me a little off guard there, I got to admit. I'd have to see the, the context, but I'm sure it, sometimes you have to remember the authors are going to throw around uh, terminology that everybody's going to understand when the book is written. So people would have understood, okay, that's probably another place of pagan worship or, or wrong worship. So uh, does that answer your question though? There, there are places of of idolatrous worship, essentially. And uh, not very many of the kings root those out. Those are the, 
Solomon let him in with his wives, and that just sent a, a bad, set a bad precedent. Uh, we also then have Hezekiah during Isaiah's ministry, and, and Hezekiah probably the peak of Isaiah's ministry. Hezekiah clung to the Lord. You remember we talked about Hezekiah as being the one who trusted the Lord the best. He trusted the Lord like no other king. Uh, and this was Isaiah's message. It was to trust the Lord. And the first time in the Old Testament actually that we see Isaiah is in 2 Kings chapter 19. You can take a look at 2 Kings 19.2. Stick a finger there in Isaiah. We'll obviously have a little more to say about Isaiah as we go. The uh, in this in this narrative, uh, Sennacherib and the Assyrians have come to the doorstep of Jerusalem, and they're mocking the. They're mocking the Jews, saying, you think your God is going to spare you from us? Uh, everybody else said the same thing about their gods, and we've already destroyed them. Hezekiah hears this. He tears his robes, his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and entered the house of the Lord. And then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household of Shebna, the scribe and the elders, of the priests, and covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. He said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress, rebuke, and rejection for the children have come to birth, and there is no strength to deliver. Perhaps the Lord your God will hear all the words of uh, Ravshekah, whom, whom his master, uh, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God, will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Uh, therefore, offer a prayer for the remnant that is left." So the servants of the king Hezekiah came to Isaiah. Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard from the servants of the king of Assyria, uh, with which the, the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. So Isaiah ministering to king Hezekiah here, says that God says, don't worry about it. And you know what happens? Sennacherib has to go back to Assyria and he's killed there in Assyria. Uh, he hears that there's uh, rebellion uh, rising back in Assyria and he goes and he doesn't give Jerusalem problems. The final king uh, during the lifetime of Isaiah is Manasseh. You'll note that he doesn't appear here at the beginning uh, of the book of Isaiah. Uh, remember, Manasseh was the worst of the kings of Judah. Uh, and Isaiah's visions are done before Manasseh comes to, uh, comes to the throne, comes to reign. Uh, tradition has it that Manasseh sawed Isaiah in two. Uh, Isaiah would have been an old man by this point. Uh, but you see... Manasseh's hatred for uh, the godly man Isaiah. Major themes in the book of Isaiah. Any questions about the, the introduction there? You get an idea of the, of the religious climate of the day. In that time period as well. First you have Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. Uh, he is consistently referred to as the God who is holy. And this is contrasted against the sinfulness of Judah and God's judgment. So you have holy God, sinful Judah, and the judgment that's going to come on Judah because of that. So you have the sinfulness also. Judah's not the only 
sinful group here. You also have the sinfulness of the nations and the judgment of the Lord. But by God's grace, we also see that the salvation that the Lord provides is also a major theme. In fact, Isaiah splits almost directly in two. The first half of the book majors on the judgment that God is going to bring, and the second half of the book majors on the uh, salvation that God is going to bring. And you can see the syllabus here uh, for a whole big list of all of the pictures that are coming of God's salvation and all of the ways that God is going to bring salvation. He's going to bring light. He's going to bring the child, the shoot, the branch from the, uh, from the stump of Jesse, the stone, the servant, the suffering servant, the redeemer of Israel, a second exodus. All of these uh, come, the second Moses, who will be endued with God's spirit, will establish justice, will call, uh, be called by Yahweh, will give a commandment, will be rejected, his humility uh, the salvation that the Lord brings uh, is pictured in all of these different ways in the book of Isaiah. It's fun, it's fun to read through and pick out uh, how that is brought about. And finally, uh, in this, we also see, you see the Spirit of the Lord is, is an important element here, but the sovereignty of God. It is God who is consistently in control of what's going on. And that's important because it's going to be important for the people to remember because what does the first half of the book uh, say is coming on the nation Israel? Consistently, judgment. But God, through the mouth of Isaiah, wants the people to understand that he is the one who's in control and that he will continue to be faithful to the promises that he's made to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, and he will bring salvation. He will bring redemption and he will bring restoration. The purpose, Isaiah writes to point out that the holy Yahweh will not permit unholiness in his people. So he will therefore deal with them in such a way as to chasten and purge them and to make them fit to participate in his program of extending his rule over the Gentiles. God is holy. He will not tolerate unholiness in his people. So he will deal with them in such a way as to chasten and purge them and make them fit to participate in his promise of extending his rule over the Gentiles. That is the message of Isaiah. For literary structure, I can bring this up. Let me dig it out here. Mm, when did I take? That is one. Excuse me. Here's what you'll have when I get you the uh, when I get you the charts, you'll have uh, Isaiah's dated oracles. An oracle is when he, when he speaks for the Lord. Uh, a number of the, of the uh, messages that Isaiah gives uh, have a date. That's, of course, going to be important. Uh, and here is the way that Isaiah lays out, though. You have an introduction at the very beginning. We already read that when it tells us when Isaiah ministered. Uh, but then you have condemnation. The rebels against Yahweh, the new moon and their Sabbath, their city, a harlot, and there's none to quench. And you'll see that the first 35 chapters of Isaiah are pretty depressing. 
you do have rays of hope. The people who walk now in darkness will see a great light. Uh, God will bring uh, a child to them, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There shall be no end to his government. So there are rays of hope, but by and large, the first 34 chapters, 35 chapters of Isaiah are, are about judgment. The people have rebelled. Remember, what does Isaiah 1 look like after the introduction? He tells them, look, you people bring offering to the court. You, you go through all the motions, but your heart is not with me. It's far from me. He says, a donkey knows its master, but you people rebel against me. He says, stop the trampling of this courts. But then what does he say in the middle of that? Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, you shall be washed white as snow. Right? That encapsulates the book of Isaiah so well. Uh, The picture is God is bringing judgment because of your sinfulness, but uh, you can repent. There is a historical interlude then here. There is connection. The faith of Hezekiah and then the folly of Hezekiah. So there is a section here that matches up very closely with what we have in 2 Kings that talks about Hezekiah's reign uh, from, verse, from chapters 36 to 39, and then comfort. So condemnation, connection, and comfort, if that helps you think through uh, the book of Isaiah. Uh, there, is, uh, there are parallels here between the beginning and the end of the book of Isaiah. You see rebels against the Lord, the new moon and Sabbath festivals. The city is a harlot. Instead, here in the end, though, they're re- rejoicing in Jerusalem. There is none to be quenched and not, and a river of life and blessings that will not be quenched. So you move through to the end uh, and you have the comfort, the salvation that God is going to bring. There's also a break here. There's, an Assyri- there's the Assyrian background up through chapter 37. Uh, and you remember what happens when Sennacherib goes back to uh, goes back to Assyria. You have the end of Sennacherib and the fall of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, but then Babylon is on its way, and Isaiah says that Babylon's on its way before Babylon is actually on its way. Uh, so there you have. Uh, Strong outline there for what the book of Isaiah will look or looks like. If you like it better in a more outliney format, uh, you'll also have this section, this chunk right here. Um, anything else in here we need to pull out? If you want uh, outlines of specific sections of the book of Isaiah. Those are also in there. There are lots of treats for you guys to look through there if you're if you're interested. All right. You guys have been sitting working hard at this for a long time. Why don't I give you five minutes or so? It's a quarter after now, and uh we'll come back at twenty after. And pick up with Jeremiah. And we should be able to get through Jeremiah uh, to close out the afternoon. All right, let's knock out uh, Jeremiah. Not knock out Jeremiah. But uh, let's take a look. Take a look, see at Jeremiah the prophet. Uh, by way of introduction... The title of the book is Jeremiah, Uh, and Jeremiah is more autobiographical than any of the other prophets. He refers to himself 33 different times. So we get more information about Jeremiah himself than we get about any of the other prophets. Uh, The writing of the book is by Jeremiah through a man named uh, Baruch. 
He was uh, Jeremiah's scribe. He were a menuensis. And he was an important part of Jeremiah's ministry. You can look at Jeremiah 36, verses 1 to 4, and you see something of his importance. It came about in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, that the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll and write on it all the words which I have spoken to you concerning Israel and concerning Judah and concerning all the nations from the day I first spoke to you from the days of Josiah even to today. Perhaps the house of Judah will hear all the calamity which I plan to bring on them in order that every man will turn from his evil way. Then I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. And Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll all the dictation of Jeremiah, all the words of the Lord which he himself, or which he had spoken to him. So Jeremiah then sends Baruch, says, I'm restricted, I can't go into the house of the Lord, so you go and read the scroll which you have written at my dictation. So Baruch is an is a important character as we move through the book of Jeremiah, and he receives specific encouragement from the Lord. You know, we'll talk something about Jeremiah and his ministry, uh, and he gets kicked around an awful lot. Now, what generally happens when you associate yourself with the prophet that nobody likes and everybody kicks around? You also, nobody likes and you get kicked around. And so Baruch is uh, given encouragement specifically from the Lord as well uh, to be strong and to be courageous. The focus of Jeremiah, again, like Isaiah, is very strongly with Jerusalem, but also Babylon, but not until chapter 20. Not until chapter 20. Jerusalem is mentioned 107 times, and Babylon, after or beginning in chapter 20, is specifically referred to 118 times. There are lots and lots of references to those two cities. The date of Jeremiah becomes significant as we look to understand uh, when Jeremiah is ministering. Uh, his ministry begins in 627 B.C. So we are a little after Isaiah. This, is the, this happens though in the 13th year, excuse me, the 13th year of Josiah's reign. Now, what do you remember? What are some of the things you remember from Old Testament 1 about Josiah? Yeah, he was right up there with Hezekiah, with Hezekiah right? Hezekiah trusted like no other king. Josiah obeyed like no other king. What did Josiah do? Do you remember that was really notable and significant? Yeah, he restored the temple. They found a copy of the law. This is after whose reign? Who, who was the bad one? Manasseh, right? Starting with Manasseh and down to Josiah, the temple had gone into disrepair. The law apparently had been lost, all, all but lost out of the kingdom. They go to repair the temple under Josiah. Josiah reads the copy of the law and says, oh no, we're not doing any of these things. And so they celebrate the Passover like had never been celebrated before. Uh, so Josiah is a godly king, but what do we find out about the godliness of Josiah? Do you remember what the, what the but is at the end of Josiah's ministry, or Josiah's reign as king? Yeah. He says, even the obedience of Josiah was not enough to turn the wrath, the anger of God away from the nation. So the turning point, the, I should say the point of no return for Judah has been reached with Manasseh. Josiah's kingship and his obedience puts off the judgment for a little bit of time, but the ministry of Jeremiah really is moving toward 586 B.C. in the fall of Jerusalem. That's where everything is going. Uh, the ministry of the prophets to the point of Jeremiah is repent, 
repent or God is going to bring judgment. Uh, the ministry of Jeremiah, by and large, is judgment's on its way. You might as well accept what God is going to bring. That's, that's essentially what God sends Jeremiah to tell the people. Now, this was the hardest of all of the books in the entire Bible to scan. Because Jeremiah is not in chronological order at all. Uh, his, the oracles there are, are organized thematically. But, and there is a little bit of historical narrative there. But don't go through Jeremiah trying to catch a plot. Because <laughs> you'll just be frustrated. Add to that that Jeremiah is one of the longest books in the Bible. And it was the hardest of the scans in seminary. It's not in chronological order, but many of the oracles that are given by Jeremiah and recorded uh, are, are dated. Okay, Many of the oracles, do we do have a date for many of those. And guess what? When they are dated, it's important. Okay? When we're given the date or the time or the situation of the oracle that Jeremiah gives, we're given it on purpose because it's significant for our understanding uh, of what's going on. So when you're reading Jeremiah and you see that a date is given, this happened in this year of this king, uh, during this event, or at this time of this reign. Pay attention to that. Take some time to uh, familiarize yourself with what was going on at that point, because that's important. Uh, I say see Jeremiah's dated oracles in historical context. That will be a part of the... the um, the chart package that I give you guys next week um, that will help set some of those dated, those dated oracles in their historical context for you. So when that happens, pay attention because it's important. <sighs> Jeremiah also, we find, has a, has a long-ranging influence. He's known by Daniel uh, during the time of the exile. It's Daniel chapter 9 verse 2 tells us that he was studying the oracles of Jeremiah when he came across the fact that the exile was going to last for 70 years and he starts to pray, okay, what next? He recognizes that the 70 years is coming up. So he's known and studied by Daniel. He's also known in the land after the exile. He has a post-exilic influence. We see that in 2 Chronicles 35 and 36, uh, that they know who Jeremiah was and they uh, pay attention to what he's written. So Jeremiah's uh, prophecy, his ministry, and the book that is written containing his prophecies, uh, they're important and they have long-reaching uh, implications. Some of the major themes that we see in the book of Jeremiah... First of all, we see that God is the one who is in control. God is the one who is in control. He is sovereign. And along with his sovereignty, the prominence of his word. What God says is what's going to happen. You can look at Jeremiah chapter 1. We won't take the time to read through that, but you can read through Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 2 through 19, and it kicks off with the prominence of God's Word. And that is a major theme as well that points to God's sovereignty. You have the sin and the judgment of Judah. 
And take a look at chapter 2, verse 11. God considers Judah to be worse than any other nation. God says, has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? In other words, all the other nations of the earth, they have their gods and they're faithful to the God of their nation or the gods of their nation. And God looks at Judah and he says, look, these nations that worship things that aren't gods, they remain faithful to their own gods. But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. My people have a relationship with the true God of the universe and they're idolaters. Whereas all the nations of the earth are faithful, remain faithful to their gods, even though their gods are not true gods. Because of the sin of the nation of Judah, Jeremiah consistently is telling the people that judgment is coming. And it is coming at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Chapters 38 and 39, Jeremiah 38 and 39 talk about that in particular. And at this point, Jeremiah says, look, there, it's coming. So... You just as well get used to that, to that fact and accept it. The false prophets, uh, the false prophets are also uh, a major element to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is consistently having to confront false prophets. And we find that the people love them. Look at, look at chapter 5 verses 30 and 31. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule on their own authority. And my people love it so. But what will you do at the end of it? God said this, this is a terrible thing that's happened here in the nation of Judah. The, the prophets, they prophesy falsely. They speak what is not true and the people eat it up. They eat it up. We also see that the prophets falsely proclaim peace. This is why the people love it. Chapter 14, verses 13 to 16. Develop this. But ah, Lord God, I said, look, the prophets are telling them, you will not set the sword, you will not see the sword nor will you have famine, but I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord God concerning the prophets who are prophesying in my name, although it was not I who sent them, yet they kept saying, there shall be no sword or famine in this land. By sword and famine those prophets shall meet their end. The people also to whom they are prophesying will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of famine and the sword, and there will be no one to bury them, neither them nor their wives nor their sons nor their daughters, for I shall pour out their own wickedness on them. This is characteristic of what's going on in Jeremiah's time. Jeremiah has to come with the, comes with the message here that you are sinful and that God is bringing certain judgment from Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians while the false prophets prophesy against uh, Jeremiah and they say, peace. You won't know famine. You won't know sword. God is going to deliver us. And God says, I have not sent them in the least bit. And you can see the summary of their ministry. We won't take the time to read all of those verses, but the summary of their ministry is in chapter 23, verses 9 through 40. And we see that they function consistently in opposition to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is consistently coming to the people saying, look, judgment is coming. And the false prophets come right behind him and they say, that Jeremiah, he's an old 
fuddy-duddy stick in the mud. He doesn't know what he's talking about. There's going to be peace and happiness and plenty of food to eat. So the people follow the false prophets. They love them. They love them. Now you might imagine how Jeremiah is uh, then uh, received by the public at large. Uh, Jeremiah is not treated well. Right? What happens to the guy who comes and tells you that judgment is coming, that people are going to die by famine and by sword, while the other people say, oh yeah, I'm actually the one who's speaking for God and he's going to deliver us. The people listen to the false prophet and they, the false prophets, and they, um, they don't treat Jeremiah well. We can, we can summarize it that way. Uh, by the time we come to the fall of Jerusalem, uh, Jeremiah has been thrown in a well, sinking in the mud, pretty much left to die. Uh, by the time we come to the end of that period of time, uh, They've discarded Jeremiah and they just assumed that he be dead. All that said, uh, Jeremiah does talk about the fact that there will be the future restoration of Judah and of Israel. And it starts out with message of that. Uh, the future restoration of Judah and Israel is looked forward to. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, but also then to build and to plant. There are four verbs for destruction used here. Pluck up, break down, destroy, overthrow. And two for restoration to rebuild and replant and at the center of that rebuilding and replanting what we find in Jeremiah the center of that restoration is the new covenant the center of that restoration is the new covenant the condition of the heart of the people is consistently seen as uncircumcised chapter 4 verse 4 Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else my wrath will go forth like fire, burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Chapter 6, verse 10, repeats the sentiment for their need of a circumcised heart, to whom, I shall, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are closed, they cannot listen. The word of the Lord has become a reproach to them, they have no delight in it. They have... They have, uh, excuse me, closed ears uh, that will not listen. Chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab and all those inhabiting the desert who clip their hair on their temples. For all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. We see that this comes about, or this is in part, because of the failure of the people in the Old Covenant. I'll give you time, or I'll, I'll leave you to read uh, Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. Uh, but let me read part of this. Verse 2, hear the words of the covenant and speak to the, to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not heed the words of this covenant, which I commanded to their forefathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So you see he's talking about the Mosaic covenant. The Lord said to me in verse 6, Proclaim all these words in the cities of, Jud of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of the covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers in the day that I brought them out from the land of Egypt, even to this day, warning persistently, saying, Listen to my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked each one in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought on them all the words of the covenant which I commanded them to do, but they did not. 
The Lord said to me, a conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They've turned their back to the iniquities of their ancestors, refused to hear my words. They have gone after other gods. Verse 11, thus says the Lord, behold, I am bringing disaster on them. The people were called to follow the the Mosaic covenant and they had not done so. They had failed to keep the Mosaic covenant so. These people who had uncircumcised hearts, ears that were closed, who had failed to follow the old covenant would receive a new covenant because of God's grace. And Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 brings this out. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Where does that sound familiar from? Well, he uses exactly that language back in chapter 11, right? To, de- to describe the Mosaic covenant. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. On their heart I will write it. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall not teach again to each his neighbor, saying each man to his brother, saying, Uh, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. These people who had an uncircumcised heart, they'll have the law of God placed in their heart uh, by means of this new covenant. The nations are important for Jeremiah. We'll we'll wrap this up very quickly. Uh, The experience of Jeremiah, you can see that there are a number of parallels there to the... um, to the experience of Christ, you can look at that in the, uh, in the charts that I give you next week. Um, the purpose of the book of Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah's ministry proclaims that Jerusalem will be destroyed by the Babylonians because of Judah's spiritual idolatry. Nevertheless, Yahweh's rule is assured through the new and Davidic covenants. The Davidic covenant also is important uh, in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, and we can, you'll see here, uh, in the, uh, excuse me, you'll see here in the, in the chart on the literary structure of Jeremiah that comfort comes at the center of the book. Uh, you have in chapters 30 and 31 the promise given in poetry. And the importance of the Abrahamic covenant, we just looked at part of chapter 31 with the new covenant. In chapter 32, the promise is given in parable. And then the the promise given in prose, the importance of the Davidic, priestly, and Abrahamic covenants. Uh, But notice the central theme here of, whoops, not what I meant to do. Notice the central theme of comfort. And how it falls at the very center, at the very heart of the book of Jeremiah. (laughs) And here you've got an introduction. Condemnation in chapters 1 through 30. Condemnation in chapters 34 to 51. But you have comfort at the center, chapters 30 through 33. Uh, If you want to read out of the book of Jeremiah and not be utterly depressed, um, my recommendation is read chapters 30 to 33. Uh, But comfort falls at the middle of all of the messages of condemnation that come. And then chapter 52 uh, outlines the destruction of Jerusalem uh, as Babylon invades. So there's the book of Jeremiah. We will pick up next week with the book of Ezekiel. Hopefully I'll have books for you next week. Um, I'm not assigning any reading out of those books. I want you to take some time to, to scan through uh, each week one of the books that we cover. So my recommendation this week is Isaiah. It's much easier to follow than Jeremiah. So...
yep, $50 for this class, and then it'll be $25 for the rest of the classes this semester. You get a better deal this semester because we'll have three terms instead of just two. So, uh, so that's thumbs up. But All right, we'll see you guys next week at 4 o'clock.